Hey, <clears throat> hey there, brother. Ba, ba, ba. Let's see. Come on, man. Right. What's up, fellas? Oh, my goodness. My phone. I left my phone over there. How you guys doing? All right. We got to wait for a few more minutes before we start, and hopefully the buffering will be gone. Right? Right, so we're just waiting a few more minutes. Just let the the modem warm up, because you know we're gonna buffer. Yeah, you know that is it's life. It's the story of my life. Okay, guys, good to see every one of you. By the grace and mercy of our trying God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I'll begin in prayer in a moment. This shirt's like getting big. See, these shirts are getting big on me. Glory to God. I praise the Lord for that. I pray. This he helps me for his glory until it's time for me to go home to rest in his presence, his glorious, beautiful presence, the presence of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. The Elder Father, so spirit. Yeah. Yeah, this guy. Sorry about that. All right. Nice shirt, huh? Hey there, brother. You know, it'd be really nice right now. Pop that collar. You're going to be really rice, uh, nice right now. I wanted to sleep, then notification. Why, Hafsa? Go ahead. You can you can go to sleep if you want. Besides pizza, you know, it'd be like truly a reward from the Lord. Not that I deserve a reward. I don't. Let me show you what the Lord says our attitude should be when we do what is commanded of us. Sorry about that. It's a little. Can I show you? As we wait a few more minutes and we begin in prayer. I ask the Spirit to show up and bless the session. Let me show you what our attitude is supposed to be when we do that which is prescribed, that which God commands. And I'm actually waiting for a few Muslims to show up or Unitarian heretics. I've challenged them. I've called this one. Yeah, in fact, his name is Kron and Bible Block. He just started the YouTube, this coward. He's a low-life thug, worse than his prophet and his God. He's on the level of an Adir Ahmed. So I've been begging him. So hopefully he'll call, and then God will then hand him over to me to decimate his false prophet, exposing him as a son of Satan is for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he doesn't show up, I challenge a Unitarian loudmouth to come. Let's see if they show up, if they have the courage. But anyway, let me show you what our attitude should be as we prepare to enter God's presence, knowing the Holy Spirit doesn't need me, but the Holy Spirit is pleased to use whomever he wants to glorify Jesus Christ. Hayden, the dingy noise is the baseball bat across your jaw that first and the last is going to have to repent of and ask for forgiveness as he spends some time in jail. Who cares about the dingy noise, dude? What's your problem, man? Man, bro. Okay, anyway. Luke 17, verses 7 to 10. Luke 17, verses 7 to 10. Let me show you what our attitude is supposed to be when we do that which is required and commanded of us. Here's what our Lord Jesus said to the apostles. Luke 17, verses 7 to 10, as the Holy Spirit beatifies me with the beauty of Jesus Christ, to radiate with the beauty of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now read this. Luke 17, verses 7 to 10. Guys, I do want you to read this. <clears throat> Pray for my throat, my chest, my lungs, my voice, because I was preaching earlier. Second session for today. I'm not a young man anymore. I don't have the energy I used to have. But which of you, Lord, the Lord Jesus speaking to the disciples, watch what he says. This is the words of Christ. Which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him, buy and buy. When he has come from the field, go and sit down to, to meet. Come and sit down and eat with me. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup. Go get my food ready and gird yourself thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk him. And afterward, thou shalt eat and drink. When I'm done, then you can eat. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? Do you thank the servant for doing what he's supposed to do? I trow not. I don't think so. So likewise, Jesus speaking to us, guys, listen. The Lord speaking to us. So likewise, ye, is when he's speaking to them, by extension, it applies to us. Ye, likewise, listen, Luke 17, 7 to 10. Right? 
Likewise, ye, when ye have done, shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable, unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. You guys can't understand? <clears throat> Did you understand what he just said? Did everyone focus on the words of our Lord Jesus? I want you guys focus. Don't be distracted. Focus. You see what he said? When you do what is expected and commanded of you, don't expect the reward or think you're doing God a favor. You're doing your duty. You're doing what you're created to do. Serve God because your joy, your peace, your wholeness, your love comes from doing that which you were created to do. Serve God and glorify him. But now here's where our Lord Jesus shows his grace and mercy. Though we shouldn't expect the reward for doing what we were created to do, serve our God, he still rewards us nonetheless. Everyone getting that? I don't know if you're getting it. He still rewards you nonetheless for doing what you're expected to do, what's your duty to do. He still rewards you anyway because he's an infinitely gracious, compassionate, good, merciful, and loving God. Right? But that should be your attitude. Number one, I'm not doing God a favor by doing that which is commanded of me. It's my duty. I exist for him. And my joy and contentment and happiness and love comes from doing that which I was designed to do, serve my creator, right? So I don't expect something. Number two, you shouldn't do it because you're going to get rewarded. You do it because you love him, right? And this is where the breakdown and relationships take place. I do something for my spouse because I want my spouse to do something in return. Well, if that's why you're doing it, your marriage won't last. It won't. But when you love someone like your children, let me give you, let me give you an example. Your children. You do stuff for your children because you love them. Whether your child reciprocates or not, your love for them is such you're doing it because you love them. You're doing it because you want the best for them. You do it because you want them to grow up happy, content, and whole. Right? So those deeds are done out of love for the child, right? And so when you do something, you don't do it because you want God to then bless you or reciprocate, right, or reward you. You do it because you love him. You do it because it delights your heart to make him happy. You do it because you are happy when your Lord is happy and content and satisfied. And by the way, that's the key to successful marriage. You know that? That's the key to successful marriage. When a spouse does something for their spouse because it makes Jesus happy, because it delights your heart to delight the heart of Jesus, because you want to show Jesus, look, Lord, I love you more than my interests. And my true happiness is to make you happy. So if serving my spouse, even if my spouse doesn't reciprocate, delights you, that's my joy. That's my peace. That's, that's why I exist, because I am happy when I see my Lord happy. Right. And again, by way of testimony, I'm going to give you a little bi biographical detail. That's where I failed in my marriage. And you guys know it. I'm divorced. And, and I, I asked the Lord Jesus, forgive me that I failed him. And I pray he has mercy on my, my ex. But that's where I failed because I checked out. After a while, I just could not love the way Jesus wanted me to love. I couldn't be Christ to her. And may the Lord forgive me for that. How you doing, A.D.? So just want to let you know that sh should be your attitude. Uh, your attitude should be, I don't do this because I'm doing God a favor. I don't do this because I want a reward. I do this because it's my duty. I exist to serve him. I exist to bring him glory and pleasure. And in so doing, that's where I find true contentment, true peace, true joy, true love, true happiness in serving the one that I was designed to serve.
You do it out of love. And yet God in his infinite love still rewards you anyway, still blesses you with gifts and ranks and rewards for doing that which you were created to do. Isn't he amazing? Right? Is that clear? I may have to put my headphones because I think my neighbor's got the music on. Now, the reason why I said that is because, you know, what would be a great reward? And not that I deserve anything from my Lord. I fail him more than I make him happy. And may he give me the power to make him happy more than I fail him. Please, Lord Jesus. And I pray that for all of us. You know, it'd be a great reward right now because in these days I've been kind of tired. I don't know if it's because coronavirus. If God wants me to get the coronavirus for his glory, give me the strength, Holy Spirit, to endure it. And if he wants me to get it and use that to take me home, Lord Jesus, take me home to be in your presence. Right? But they say one of the signs of coronavirus is like your little fatigue. Anyway, this will be done. I don't, yeah. You know, it'd be a blessing because I'm tired right now. And, you know, and I share it with you because this is like my YouTube family. We are like a church in the sense that we've become family. I know the regulars. I see them often. I have a rapport, a connection with you because of Jesus. Yeah, I'm tired, Broadus. I really am, like mentally and physically. I'm drained these days, very drained. You know, it'd be a blessing right now. Refresh my spirit, refresh my heart. To hold my daughters in my hand in my hands, to have my baby and my oldest daughter in my arms right now, sitting in my lap, and me just kissing them, hugging them, holding them tight, and just affirming them, verbally saying, how much Baba loves you. You do not know how much Baba loves you. That would be a great reward. Yeah, that'd be a great reward. But if I don't get to do that now, I know in Jesus' name. I know because Christ is risen. I know because Jesus lives. I know he lives. I know he lives. He is risen. He is alive. I'll have everlasting time to do that in his presence. Everlasting time meaning never-ending time where when jesus comes or when he takes me home i know by his grace and mercy he will bring my children and then i can hug my children and kiss them and walk with them in the garden i can hold their their hands in a perfect world no more pain no more suffering no more misery no more disease no more anger no more hatred, no more filthy, wicked, corrupt judges, whores of the devil using the legal system to punish men unjustly. No more corrupt, filthy lawyers of the devil, demons whom the Lord Jesus will chasten. No more adultery. No more men preying on married women. And then I can enjoy them. And we'll be together forever. Right? Amen. So that would be something but if the lord doesn't want to give it to me now his will be done we love you father lord jesus we love you holy spirit we love you father for the sake of jesus my lord rejuvenate me replenish me reinvigorate me with the life from your holy spirit fill me with power from your holy spirit with passion from your holy spirit with love from your holy spirit and heal our broken hearts and destroy every anger or hatred we have in our hearts towards those who have sinned against us and destroyed our, our homes, Lord. Because they too are vessels created for the glory of Jesus. They too will face Jesus either in, in love and compassion or wrath and destruction. So have mercy on them, Lord. And save us from the children of Satan. Grant them repentance to escape the snares of Satan. And until then, keep them away from us. Keep this wicked, filthy judge, this demon, away from me and my children, Lord Jesus. Bless everyone here. Strengthen them. Fill them with the joy of your Holy Spirit. Fill them with, with love and peace. And give us the grace to be holy and pure and righteous and obedient. To love Jesus by our deeds and not just our words. And that Jesus will increase in us and that we will decrease, Father. He'll sit and throne upon our hearts and the hearts of our loved ones, the hearts of my daughters, Father. You are their true Father. 
You are their true father. You, Lord. And you love them more than they can know and I can imagine. Bless them, Lord. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life to speak with passion and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father, of your children, Father. Fill me with the spirit to recall the passages perfectly, interpret them correctly, and give us the power to understand them and live them out passionately for the glory of Jesus. Save us from the children of Satan and their distractions, Lord. Have your way and bring more people, Father. Lord Jesus, bring more people to this channel for your glory, not for the praise of men. Bring more people, Holy Spirit, and then provide for us our daily bread. Sustain us until we enter the presence of Christ. We thank you. Yahovah Rapha, we thank you. Yahovah Shalom, we thank you. Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Nisi, we thank you. Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let me just get my earplugs because my neighbor is playing music and I don't want you to hear it. So hold on a second. Man, I make white look good, right? It's not the clothes that make the man. Ladies, it's not the clothes that make the man. It's the man that makes the clothes because I'm just gorgeous. Arr! Hold on. See if I can find it. Yeah, I'm going to find it. Now when I want to find it, I can't find it. You believe it? Oh, boy. Hold on. Ay, vey. Ay, vey. Now when I want to find it, I can't find it. Can you believe it? Ah, 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 you punish me. La, 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 la. Remember that, ladies. Don't hate. Don't hate, ladies. Don't hate. Participate. Single, ready to mingle. All right. Now with that said, we're going to continue where we left off. I know, really. Okay. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, I can hear it. I can hear it. And if it's going to distract me, it's probably going to distract you. Can you guys still hear me? Yes or no? Okay, good. All right. I just don't want you to be distracted because it's distracting me. So pray I can focus. Okay. Hey, thank you, Rebel Mark. Now, guys, thank you for all your super chat. It's appreciated. But now, by the grace of God, guess what? I have to now figure out how to then collect. For the past several months, you guys have been giving generously, but I haven't collected because I don't know how. But first and last is trying to help me to collect. So God bless you. It helps. We're in full-time ministry. So the Lord Jesus bless you. Okay. Hold on. Why is this work? Yeah, right. Okay. Now, with that said, now, if you haven't collected for a while, does that mean they return your money? Then it sucks being me. They already take 30% of what you give. <laughs> All right. Let's continue where we left off. Let's continue where we left off by the grace of God. I know it got really intense and personal last night, right? It really got intense and personal last session. Oh, and by the way, here's the link. Tomorrow, God willing, Lord Jesus willing. Here you go. I believe my debate will take place at yeah, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Pray for me. I'm at a disadvantage because I'm not a scholar of Mormonism. I do know enough that Joseph Smith was a son of Satan who taught a corrupt doctrine of the Godhead. Pray that God will anoint me to expose Joseph Smith and destroy the objections of Kwaku, because you can tell from his face. Honestly, I don't just throw this out there. You can tell from his face he's really demonized. You can see there's this nasty, wicked just presence about him because he's completely demonized. May God have mercy on his pathetic soul. So pray the Lord will use me to silence him for the glory of Jesus and take him captive for the glory of Christ, right? So it's tomorrow. Here's the link again. So pray. Pray for the victory for Christ. It's about his glory, not about me. Now, I just gave you the link, Carly. You click on it, you'll see it. Now, with that said, let's continue where we left off. I was demonstrating that God loves the sinner and hates the sin, but at the same time, the scriptures, our ultimate authority, the, the inspired scriptures, the voice of God in the scriptures testify God hates the sinner and the sin. You guys remember that? Right? God hates the sinner and the sin. Thank you, and child of God. I'm child of Jesus. God hates the sinner and the sin. So let's let's explore that a little further to explain it and then go into why we sin and why we need to be born again. Because it's all related. Somehow, by the grace of God's Spirit, it's all related. And I trust the Holy Spirit to take over and help me focus and save me from error and bless you to fall more passion in love with Jesus Christ. 
So we ended it by looking at the passages in Leviticus. We went from Deuteronomy to Leviticus. Now, remember, we're not going to quote these, but I'm going to repeat the verses again. I want you to count how many verses there are that state God hates the sin and the sinner. While at the same time, the Bible says God loves the sinner and hates the sin. Is there a contradiction? No contradiction. But let me repeat some of the passages. Are you ready? Leviticus 20, 23. Write these down, Leviticus 20, 23, Leviticus 26, verse 11, verse 30, and verses 43 to 44, specifically verse 44. Leviticus 26, verse 11, verse 30, verses 43 to 44, and then the passages in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18, verse 12, Deuteronomy 18, verse 12, Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Deuteronomy 23, verse 18, but we read 17, 18 for the context. Deuteronomy 23, verses 17, 18, and Deuteronomy 25, verse 16, and that's where we stop. Deuteronomy 25, verse 16, and that's where we stop. We actually stop with Leviticus. So keep those verses in mind. Count, right, how many that was. Because now let's go to the psalmist, the Psalter. Are you ready? Are you ready to explore? You ready to explore? Now, my Skype is open for these Mohammedan dogs and this Unitarian dog, but they won't call because they know better. Okay. Now, let's go to Psalm 5. God bless you, Igor. Lord bless you and watch over you. Psalm 5, verses 4 to 7, but specifically verses 5 to 6. Psalm 5, verses 4 to 7, but specifically verses 5 to 6. Watch here. Psalm 5, verses 4 to 7, specifically verses 5 to 6. Read with me now. Now I need you to focus, not be distracted. Focus. Focus. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. You are not a God. You're not a God, right? Pay attention now. You're not a God that takes pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. Someone who persists in evil cannot... Remain in your presence indefinitely. If you are evil and you indulge in evil acts and you justify the evil you do and you're not repentant, you cannot remain in God's presence indefinitely. Now notice what it says in 5 to 6. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. They cannot stand in your sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Notice what it doesn't say. You hate all their iniquity. No, you hate them that work iniquity. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Now notice verse 6. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing, meaning lies, deceit, trickery, that can I. The Lord Jehovah will abhor, detest utterly the bloody and deceitful man. So then how do you enter his presence then? But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. Right? In the multitude of thy mercy... And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Did you guys catch it? Did you guys catch it there? You see what 5 and 6 state? You abhor, you detest, you hate those who work sin, who are bloody, meaning murderers, who shed innocent blood, and are deceivers. You abhor them. You detest them. You despise them. You hate them. So how can anyone enter your presence? Because of your mercy and with reverence, approaching you reverently, Knowing he can consume you, but in his mercy he chooses not to. Clear? Clear? Before I move on? <clears throat> Just want to make sure you get it before I move on. Right? All right. Psalm 11, verse 5. Psalm 11, verse 5. Count now. I'm going to ask you, keep a tab on how many verses this is. That happens to be. Psalm 11, verse 5. Jehovah the Lord trieth the righteous. He lets the righteous be tested to be refined and perfected and sanctified. But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Let's read the last part again. But the wicked and him that loveth violence... His soul, God's soul, hates. He doesn't just hate his sin, he hates him. You see that? Psalm 53, verse 5. Psalm 53, verse 5. 
Okay, Psalm 53, verse 5. Watch here. There were they there were they in great fear where no fear was. It's not about the enemies of God. For God hath scattered the bones of him that encampeth against thee, those who tried to destroy Israel. Thou hast put them to shame. Why did you put them to shame, Israel? Why were you able to defeat your enemies? Because God hath despised them. God hath despised them. So Israel, why were you able to destroy your enemies? Because God despised them because of their sin and used, the, used you as an enemy to punish them. Wow. And how many verses are that? Are, are there that say that God hates the sinner and the sin? Psalm 106, verse 40. I think we're going to block someone here. Be asking a silly question and pretending to be sincere. Therefore was the wrath of Jehovah kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. Even Israel God abhorred and punished, but not utterly. Did you catch it? Epsa, you're letting her distract you. See, you know better than that. Why do you allow these agents of the devil to distract you? Then you distract me, Hepsa. Why? Earlier I called you Hadessa. I don't mean to insult Hadessa. Anyway, focus. Did you catch it? So God is impartial and just. He will also despise and abhor Israel, not just the nations, if they do what is wicked. You see how fair God is? He's saying, I even abhorred you. I detested you for your evil, and I punished you accordingly. Right? Everyone get it before I move on? Is it sinking in? There's still more. Proverbs 3.32. Proverbs 3.32. Proverbs 3.32. Watch here. We're not done. You're going to be bored, and I'm going to put you to sleep because there's so many passages. You're like, <sighs> anyway. For the froward, froward is an abomination to Jehovah, but a secret is with the righteous. The corrupt and the perverse, froward means the perverse, God detest them. They're an abomination to Jehovah. Now, Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. This is a long one, folks. This is a long one. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. Now watch. Proverbs 6, verse 16 and 19. Yeah, I'm, I'm a priest. I'm about to bless you by laying hands on you, hyper place, because we're going to send you on your merry way. These things, these six things that Jehovah hate. What are the six things that Jehovah hates? Seven are an abomination unto him. So if you're an abomination, that means Jehovah despises you. What are the six and seven things that Jehovah hates and are an abomination to him? Guys, pay attention. Okay, so the children of the devil are coming to distract you guys. Pay attention. Rebuke that in Jesus' name. What are the six things that God hates, right? The seven things that are abomination to him. Lord Jesus, rebuke Satan by the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, I want you to a proud look. He hates the proud. He hates someone who's proud and arrogant. A lying tongue. He hates their tongue. Their arrogant look. Their lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. He hates their hands that murder. A heart, a mind that deviseth wicked imagination. So he hates their look, their face. He hates their tongue. He hates their hands. He hates their minds and their hearts. And their desires and their thoughts. He hates their feet. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. He hates the false witness that speaketh lies. And he that sowed discord among brethren. And he hates the one who divides the brethren. Who causes division. What part of the wicked does he like? What part of the wicked does he like? He hates the face of the wicked. The tongue of the wicked. The hands of the wicked. The feet of the wicked. The heart of the wicked, the thoughts of the wicked. He hates the one who slanders and lies against his neighbor and divides people. Is there a part of the wicked he likes? Is there a part of the wicked he likes? Proverbs 11, verse 20. We're not done yet. No, he doesn't hate the repentant wicked. He loves the repentant wicked. Proverbs 11, verse 20. 
Watch here. Proverbs 11, verse 20. They that are of a forward heart, meaning a perverse heart, an evil heart, a perverted heart, are abomination to Jehovah, Yahovah. But such as are upright in their way are his delight. He delights in the righteous. He detests the wicked, the perverse, right? Clear? Oh, but we're not done yet. Proverbs 12, 22. Man, how many? Man, I'm getting tired. Aren't you guys getting tired? Proverbs 12, 22. I'm getting tired. I'm ready to check out and take a nap. Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are abomination to Jehovah, but they that deal truly are his delight. He hates the lips that lie. He hates liars, but he loves the upright, the righteous men and women of integrity. Proverbs 15, 26. Proverbs 15, 26. Proverbs 15, 26. Watch here. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to Jehovah, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. So the thoughts of the wicked disgust Jehovah. He detests them. The lips of the wicked he detests. They're an abomination. What part of the wicked pleases God? Nothing. Now, Proverbs 16, verse 5. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Scary, isn't it? Proverbs 16, verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to Jehovah. If you're an arrogant, proud person, think how yourself. You're an abomination to Jehovah. You disgust them. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. All right, are we done? No. Jeremiah 12, verse 8. We're not done yet. Jeremiah 12, verse 8. Jeremiah 12, verse 8. Exactly, Christos and Esti, you got it. Let me repeat what he said. This means we and ourselves can't even approach God as we were are all wicked. He meant to say as we were all wicked. I'm a liar, a sinner, arrogant, have evil thoughts, now made righteous by Christ alone. Amen. That's the point. You need the blood of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, the covering of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to even make you acceptable in sight of God. Okay, now Jeremiah 12, 8, Jeremiah 12, 8, mine heritage, Israel is unto me as a lion that in the forest, Israel is acting like a lion that wants to attack me, that's prowling against me, that wants to devour me, that's how Israel's acting towards me, it crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it, <whistles> let's post that one more time, Woo! let's post that one more time, you see how fair, balanced, impartial God is? He's saying, even Israel I've hated for her wickedness. I didn't overlook Israel's wickedness. I didn't blink at it, right? I didn't make excuses. I hated them too. I despised them too. I abhorred them as well. My own heritage, my own people. My heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me, where, where, therefore have I hated it. Wow, what a fair God. God, you are so amazingly fair and just and impartial. A few more, and I want to explain hate, love and hate and some biblical concepts. Pray now, the Spirit fill me to tread reverently because now I'm going to go into some deep doctrines, trusting the Spirit to anoint me to speak with wisdom from the Spirit to bless you for the glory of Jesus, right? Hosea 9.15, again about Israel. Hosea 9.15 or Hosea. Hosea 9.15 or Hosea 9 verse 15. Hosea, Hosea 9.15. Hosea, Hosea 9.15. All their wickedness in Gilgal, for there I hated them. Wow, God, you hated Israel, Judah, and Gilgal? For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. And if you didn't get it, I won't love them anymore. I will hate them. That's the key. I won't love them anymore. I will hate them. Guys, don't forget this verse. This is the key. 
and understanding how all of these statements are true. They're not contradictory. Okay, this is the key. I won't love them anymore. I will hate them. Did that? Did you get this passage? Is it sinking in? This is the passage that's the hermeneutical key. And understanding how all of this is true, there are no contradictions in the Bible. Everyone got that? I will love them no more. I will hate them for their evil, their wickedness, their abomination. That's the hermeneutical key. Okay? And we're going to unpack this. But let's look at another one. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, which is quoted by Paul in Romans 9, verse 13, as the Lord Jesus gives me unction or call the information. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, cited in Romans 9, verse 13, but we're just going to look at Malachi and explain what it doesn't mean. What it means and what it doesn't mean. Malachi 1, 2 to 3. I have loved you, say Jehovah. He's talking to the Israelites. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? How have you loved us? How have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, say Jehovah? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, notice what God is saying. You are the sons of Jacob. Jacob had a twin brother, Esau, who is a few minutes older than him. But here is the proof I love you. I chose Jacob's descendants, not the descendants of Esau. I chose Jacob's descendants, not the descendants of Esau. What more proof do you want that I love you? I chose you, the descendants of Jacob, Jacob over against the descendants of Esau. And Esau, I hated. Now, are you ready now to go into some meat? And by the way, before we go into the meat, how many passages? How many passages was that? Did, were you counting? How many passages that emphasized over and over and over again? God hates the wicked and their wickedness. God hates the sinner and the sin. Who counted? You're guessing? Don't guess. May the Holy Spirit perfect my ability to recall all this information. You sure? Let's go backwards. I'm going to count backwards. Count with me, okay? We're going to go backwards. Are you ready? We're going to go backwards. That was Hosea. I'm sorry. Malachi 1, 2 to 3. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. So count that as 1. Hosea chapter 9, verse 15. Count. Guys, count. 2. Jeremiah 12, verse 8, 3. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, verse 5. Proverbs 15, 26. Proverbs 12, 22. Proverbs 11, verse 20. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. Proverbs 3, verse 32. We go to the Psalter. Psalm 106, verse 40. Psalm 53, verse 5. Psalm 11, verse 5. Psalm verses 5 to 6. Twice he talks about hate and abhor. Five, chapter 5, verses 5 to 6. Now let's go to Deuteronomy. We're going backwards now. Deuteronomy 25, 16. Deuteronomy 23, 18. Even though 17, 18 for context. Deuteronomy 23, 18. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Deuteronomy 18, verse 12. Leviticus 26, 44. 43 and 44 for context, 44, Leviticus 26, 30, Leviticus 26, 11, Leviticus 20, 23. Yes, Christos and Esti, from memory. The Holy Spirit be glorified, magnified for his almightiness. This is all from memory. I don't have notes in front of me. I want him to be glorified for this anointing. You should know that, Christos and Esti. Don't ask me that because I don't want people to think I'm boasting and showing off. May the Lord destroy my pride, my arrogance, and false sense of humility. Right? Now let's unpack it. Are you ready to go into meat? You ready to go into, into some meat now? Yeah. I don't have just way I want because I want God to be glorified in this gift and anointing so you can marvel how real Jesus is. That he can take an uneducated bum like me and show his power and glory so that Jesus gets the glory and the praise. And let me encourage you, someone like me, GED, no 
college, no university, no seminary, then imagine what God can do through you if you trust and believe and have no doubt he's real and he's almighty and he loves you. Right? When I do the light, I don't have notes with me. Okay? So let that encourage you then. Let that encourage you. Now, when 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31 states, God chooses the people that the world considers foolish, marginalized, useless, and then he shines through them to silence those who think they're great and wise, you know the Bible is real because that's what God does. Right? Everyone getting how real your God is and how amazing he is and how much he loves you and what he can do through you if you believe and have no doubt. Right? I should let that sink in. Now, with that said, with that said, let's explain what it meant that God says he hated Esau. Let me show you what it does not mean. Let's explain what God meant that he hated Esau. Let me show you what it doesn't mean. Let's go to Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 to 8. Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 to 8. Are you ready? Because I got to do a lot of unpacking here. And I'm actually feeling tired for you guys. Like I'm, I'm torturing you guys. I'm boring you guys. You know? I hope not. I really hope not. I don't want to be a burden on you guys, honestly. Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 to 8. Let's read. Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 to 8. The Edomites are the sons of Esau. Esau's name was Edom. Notice what God says to Israel about the sons of Esau. Pay attention. Deuteronomy 2, verses 48. And command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau. You, you Israelites are about to pass, and you're going to approach the land of the sons of Esau, their land, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Right? Right? Take ye... ye <clears throat> Man, too many texting and I lose it. See, that's what happens when you text guys. It's all right. Great. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breath. I'm not going to give you any part of their land. So don't even think about it. Don't even think about trying to take their land. Why? Because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. I gave them the land. I gave Esau's sons this land. Ye shall buy meat of them for money, that ye may eat, and ye shall also buy water of them for money, that ye may drink. Now notice 7 to 8. 7 to 8, follow me. 7 to 8, if we find 7. For the Lord, Jehovah thy God, hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through the great wilderness these 40 years. Jehovah the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Now notice verse 8. And when we passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, to the way of the plain from Elath and from Izion Gaber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Did you guys understand what you just read? Did you guys understand what you just read? Thank you, Craig. God bless you. What did God tell Israelites not to do? Don't you dare attack the sons of Esau, don't you dare mess with them. Don't you dare think about taking their land. I gave them the land as their possession out of my grace and love for Esau. Did you catch what he just did? By giving the sons of Esau their own land, by blessing the sons of Esau with property and territory and provision, God was showing love for Esau and his children. Is that sinking in or you got distracted by side discussions that are relevant to the topic? Is that sinking in? I want to make sure you're getting it because this is time to learn your faith. Okay. Let's now look at Deuteronomy 2, 16 to 23. Deuteronomy 2, 16 to 23. And he's saying more than that daily light. He's also saying... I too brought the sons of Esau into their land and gave them their land and fought for them, so don't mess with them. Deuteronomy 2, 16 and 23. Thank you, Darren. Lord bless you. Now watch. Okay. 
Focus, or you're going to lose this. It came to pass when all the men of war were consumed, and then from among the people, now watch, that the Lord Jehovah spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. Now watch. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, Ammon was the son of Lot. A Ammon was the son of Lot. When you come to the children of Ammon, the Ammonites in their land, what does he say to them? Guys, please read this. Do not distress them. Distress them not. Nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon, Ammon any possession. Because I've given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. That's their land. I gave it to them out of my grace, out of my provision for the sake of Lot. Don't mess with them, Israel. Now notice what he says in 20, 23. Here's where you got to read and listen. That also was accounted a land of giants. The land that he gave to the Ammonites, giants lived in the land. Nephilim lived in the land. Giants that dwelt therein of old time. And the Ammonites called them Zamzumims, a people great, many, and tall as the Anakims. But Jehovah destroyed the giants, Zamzumims, before them. And they succeeded them, succeeded them, and dwelt in their stead. As he did to the children of Esau, guys, pay attention. As he did to the children of Esau, Esau which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, even unto this day. And the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Aza, the Kaftorims, which came forth out of Kaftor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. I don't think you guys caught what you just read. Deuteronomy 2, 16 to 23. God said, Israel, I did for them what I did for you. I did for the Ammonites. I did for the Edomites, the sons of Esau. I did for the Kaftorim, the descendants of Ham, what I did for you. Like you, I drove out giants by their hands. Like you, I gave them power to destroy the inhabitants of their land, of, the, of these lands, these evil giants, these wicked giants. And like you, I gave them those lands as their inheritance. I did for them what I did for you, showing the same love for them that I showed for you. Do you understand what he did? God showed love to the sons of Esau, to the sons of Ammon, to the descendants of Ham, the Kaftorim, the same way he showed love for Israel. That's what you just read. Deuteronomy 2, 16 and 23. If you guys focus and don't be distracted with side talk. Reread it again. And what did he tell Israel? Notice what he told Israel. Hey, just because you're my covenant people, my people on earth to represent me and shine my light to the nations, doesn't mean you're going to attack them. Don't you dare oppress them, threaten them, meddle with them, and think I'm going to give you a piece of their land. Their lands belong to them. Stay away from them. That's what he's telling the Israelites. You just read it day to day. Why are you shocked? Reread Deuteronomy 2, 16 and 23. It's right there. We just read it. Here, if I have to explain that, you know I'm going to end up hurting you, right, Ron here? He shows mercy because he's loving. He shows love because he's merciful. Only someone like you would make a distinction between the two. Lucy's, yeah. Lucy, I'm going to answer your question, and I'm tempted to see maybe this is too much for you. You shouldn't stay here. Just because he dispenses a people, why does he then give the land to, to the people that come after them? If that's not because of his grace. God didn't have to give the land to the Edomites. He could have destroyed those people and given it to Israel. So why did he give them the land, Lucy? Let's see if you're figuring this out. If I have to explain this, then that means either I'm failing to communicate or this session may not be for everyone. So why didn't he have the Israelites destroy these people and take their lands? Why did he give it to others if it wasn't love and mercy? I 
I'm honestly, I'm being honest. Sometimes I'm shocked by the questions. Because honestly, you don't need to be Einstein to understand this. This is simple, basic. But people want to complicate things or sound intelligent. Sai Christian, we need to put him on timeout. Get him out of here. I'm going to have to put you on timeout. No, because see, I got to be impartial, Sai. I have to now imitate the God we serve. He's impartial. So just because you're my friend, I got to put you on timeout. Okay? So, Lucis, answer my question. Why did he give the land to the Edomites after he dispossessed the giants that lived there? Why not give it to the Israelites if it wasn't because his love for the Edomites? Answer the question, Lucis. That didn't answer my question, Lucis MVV. Let me ask it again. Why did he give the land to the Edomites after destroying the wicked people in the land? Why not just give it to Israel? Destroying them for their wickedness is one thing. Giving the land to someone else is another thing. Why did he give it to that particular people? Do we need to reread the verses again? Because he said, I gave it as a possession to Esau. I gave it as a possession to Lot. Why? Okay. That's why don't overcomplicate things. You really don't need to be Einstein. I'm not saying this to belittle. You guys are intelligent. You don't need to be Einstein. Figure it's simple. Don't make it. We think it's got to be complicated. It's got to be more. No, it's simple. That's why. Not only for the sake of Abraham, Ron, here, right? It's for the sake that God loves his creation. Don't you get what I'm trying to show you? God loves all his creatures, and this leads me to unpacking the meaning of these passages. Why did I keep saying Hosea 9 verse 15 is going to be the key, the hermeneutical key? What's the key? That God can stop loving a people that he has been loving and start hating them justly because they constantly rebel against him, defy him. And defile themselves. And therefore God says enough is enough. That's the message. That's the message. Are you getting it now? The Bible's teaching is that God loves all his creation. And he blesses all his creation. And he graces all his creation. And he provides for all his creation, even his enemies. But there's a point to how much he will put up with. And once you reach the point, God says, now you've blasphemed the spirit. Now you've grieved the spirit to such a point. There is no return. And I'm done. Now my love turns to hate. You understand now where I'm trying to lead you with these examples, where I'm trying to lead you? Is everyone getting it? If you interpret scripture, light of scripture, and ask the spirit to guide you, you will see how it all makes sense. How it all makes sense. Now, let me show you that the Bible is clear. He loves every creature. He loves the Sodomites. When I say Sodomites, I mean the descendants of Sodom. I should have chosen a better word. Sorry. Sodomite right now means homosexual. I meant the descendants of Sodom. He loves Sodom and Gomorrah. He loves the Edomites. He loves the Israelites. He loves the Babylonians. He loves the Egyptians. He loves all creatures. And how do I know? Let's go to Matthew 5, 43, 48. I know, wrong use of term. Uh, wrong term, I know. Matthew 5, 43, 48. Matthew 5, 43, 48. Read with me. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your father. See, when you love your enemies, you're acting like your father. You're behaving like your father. You're reflecting your father's character. Because your father loves his enemies. And provides for his enemies. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he 
maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans, the tax collectors, do the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even publicans, tax collectors, do the same? But be ye there perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Did you catch it now? Thomas, if I have to answer that question, I don't know if you're asking sincerely. If you're asking to challenge me, you're not going to last long. Is Pharaoh, was Pharaoh God's enemy, Thomas? He was an enemy of God. Was Pharaoh an enemy of God, Thomas? Hold on. Let me answer this. I know, Alex, you know the answer. I'm asking Thomas. Thomas, before the rapture this year, we don't have too much time. Answer the question quickly, brother. Was Pharaoh God's enemy? If he doesn't answer in 10 seconds, block him because I don't have time for games. 10, 9, 8. Okay, good, Thomas. You see, now when I scare you, now you respond. Did you not just read what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43, 48? That Jesus said, be like your father who even loves his enemies and provides for his enemies. So be like your father and loving your enemies. Reflect your father's nature. So Pharaoh is an enemy and God loves his enemies. That means God loved Pharaoh. Do you want further proof, folks, that God loved Pharaoh? Do you want further proof that God loved Pharaoh? Okay. Whenever Pharaoh asked Moses to ask God to remove the plague, did God remove the plague and show mercy to Pharaoh by removing the plague? If you read Exodus, every time God brought a plague, Pharaoh said, pray to Jehovah to remove this plague, I'll let you go. And God did. But notice when Pharaoh hardened his heart even more. Not when God brought the plague, but when God removed the plague and showed him mercy, he hardened himself against God's mercy more and more. Do you see the irony? When God brought a plague, Pharaoh then cried out for mercy. When God showed him mercy, Pharaoh became more defined in his opposition to God. Do you see the irony here? Thank you, Lisa. Notice it's in response to God's mercy and compassion that Pharaoh becomes hardened. In other words, he didn't care for God. He only cared what God could do for him. Remove the plagues and I'll let you go. Oh, now you remove the plagues as a sign of your compassion and mercy? I want to have nothing to do with you and your people ain't going nowhere. So he put God in that position to say, all right, Pharaoh, here I gave you nine chances. Nine chances to turn to me and fear me to know that I am God and not your gods. But what did you do every time I showed you mercy? You became even more stiff-necked against me. And even then, when he struck his firstborn and Pharaoh let the people go, what did Pharaoh do? Repent? Or did he then bring chariots and his army to slaughter the Israelites in defiance of God, even though he saw the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire before his eyes, that still did not deter him from wanting to kill the people of God. So was God just in what he did to Pharaoh? He is seeing the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, knowing that's the God of the Hebrews. And he says, you know what? You're not going to stand in my way. I'm going to kill your people dead. Defying God to his face. Yes, 1611, you got it. 16, I want to kiss your head. Notice what 1611 said. How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? By showing him mercy. Every time he showed him mercy, he became even hardened. You got it. Isn't that the irony and the mystery? 
Isn't that like, that's what should shock you. He became hardened in response to God's mercy. Is it now sinking in? Oh, okay, Thomas. Okay, now you get a free pass. You can ask me. If I knew it's you, I knew you're asking sincerely. I get people who come under different aliases. I don't know who they are. Now I need to repent and I need to block David N for Thomas's sin. Red, because of that, I'm gonna have to punish someone else for your sin, brother, because I love you. Okay, so but you got the answer, Thomas? Yeah, he's a good brother. I didn't know. Because I don't know, guys. Remember, I'm gun shy. I'm like, you know, trigger happy. I get attacked, like you see, this Muhammad and came attacked. So I'm quick to now just shoot. Shoot, right? And then ask questions later. So I don't know. I gotta maintain control. So forgive me. But Thomas, did that answer your question? Poor Thomas. No wonder I put the fear of God in him. He's like he was shaking at the... Oh, no, he called me out. Sam, man, it's red, bro. Okay, now is that clear? Now let's go to Acts 17, 24 to 28. Acts 17, 24 to 28. Acts 17, 24 to 28. Watch here. Now tell me the, if this applies to every creature, every human being born from Adam, every human descendant of Adam. Tell me if this applies to every human descendant of Adam. Acts 17, 24, 28. God, pay attention, God, that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord over heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need your sacrifices. He doesn't need your food offerings. Neither is worship with men's hands. As though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And he hath made of one blood, of one couple, Adam and Eve, of one man. He made from them all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, when they will live and where they will live. He's determined when you will live and where you will live. Why? Verse, seven, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if perhaps happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of one of your own poets have said, for we are also all his offspring. Lord, loosen my tongue. Okay. He just said, Paul just said, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God has made all human beings from one blood. And he's placed all human beings exactly where they're at and when they will live. And he provides for all human beings. He gives them life and nourishment. And he's put them where they're at so that all of them will find him. Is there anyone excluded? Is anyone excluded in what you just read? Anyone omitted? Anyone omitted? Wait, that means that includes Esau, Lot, Ammon, Moab, Ham, Canaan, right? Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar. It includes every one of them. So why are you surprised that God showed love to every one of them? Why are you surprised that God loved Esau enough to fight for his descendants? To destroy the, the giants because of their evil. Because they didn't repent. Even though God showed them love. But they didn't repent. And he was now fed up with them. They had reached the point of no return. Now it's time to wipe you out. You come in. But I'm going to do the same thing to you that I did to them. If you do what they did against me. Do you see now the consistency? Yes, exactly, Christos Anesti. Do you see now the consistency? Right? And do you see how impartial and just and fair he is? Why? Because he drove out the giants in the lands that he gave to the Edomites, the sons of Esau, and the Ammonites and the Kaphtorim, because those giants were evil and wicked 
defying God, defiling themselves, and they reach the point of no return like the Canaanites. And God says, now I'm done with you. I put up with your sins long enough. I've tolerated your evil long enough. I've to tolerated your blasphemies, your murders, your incest your long enough. You've now reached the point where you've grieved my spirit. You've now blasphemed the spirit. I'm done with you. Time for judgment. And now bring in another group. But then God says, be careful, Israel. I'm going to do to you what I did to the Canaanites. Edomites, I'm going to do to you what I did to them. Ammonites, I will do to you what I did to them if you act like them and do not fear me and walk in covenant faithfulness. No, daily light. They were not demons. No, that's a misreading of the text. They are not demons. Okay. Is it now making more sense? And now you're seeing why God can say he loves and he hates? Who's not getting it? I don't even know if our sister Louise is here. I hope she's here. Maybe she couldn't make it. I haven't heard from her. The regulars are here. Huff says here. I know my sister here. Magdalena was here. I don't know if she left, but all right. Right? Is it now making sense? God loves every creature that he's made, and he's proven his love for every creature. By giving them their provisions, giving them their allotment, right? And making his existence known to them. But when they keep defying God, rebelling against God, opposing God, and they keep perverting themselves, committing gross, immoral, evil deeds, murdering children, incest, bestiality, right? Homosexuality, idolatry, then there is a limit to how much God will put up with. Once you reach the limit, he goes, I'm done. It's enough. You now reach the point where my spirit is grieved. You blast. And remember, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it's over for you. Because the Holy Spirit is the one working to convict them. Convict them. Convict them. If they keep resisting and resisting and resisting, the Holy Spirit says, enough. You have grieved me to such a point. You blast me such a point, I'm done with you. And once the Holy Spirit is done with you, the Father is done with you, the Son is done with you. Exactly, Jake. You know that? That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is constantly convicting you and reminding you and convincing you, turn from your sinful way. Fear the God who made you. <laughs> Repent of your abominations. And he keeps doing it day in, day out, day in, day out. And you keep resisting him and keep insulting him. And he says, enough is enough. Now you reach the breaking point. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But now we don't know when that time, that limit, you know, when you reach that limit. In other words, I cannot put a time or an amount of sin until you hit that breaking point. In other words, I can't say... That God will put up with America's abomination for another 50 years and that's it. I don't know. God knows the limit of how much abomination and sin he'll tolerate individually and collectively. Before he says, it's done, it's over, now it's time for destruction. Right? So has America reached that point? I don't know. Will it reach that point five years from now? Ten years from now? Fifty? Only God knows. And then God will bring destruction. Remove his hand of protection. Allow demons and evil spirits to wreak havoc and chaos. Or empower another evil nation mightier than us to bring us to our knees. That's how God works. Can I show you God doing that? So, Sai Christian, I hope you love me. Because I'm trying to be impartial and just like the God we serve, right? Because Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So people know that as much as I love you, I put you on time out. Because I can't show favoritism. No hard feelings, Sai Christian. So I'm practicing what I preach. Now, can I show you examples where God says, enough is enough, I'm done? Nothing you can do will now stop me from bringing judgment. It's over. And I will have to pour out my wrath until my wrath is spent and I'm appeased. Let me show you. Jeremiah 15, verse 1. He says that about the Jews. Jeremiah 15, verse 1. He says that about the Jews. Look what he says to, to Jeremiah. 
Watch here. Jeremiah 15, verse 1. Then said Job unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. You see what he said? Moses interceded in the wilderness and stopped me from destroying Israel. Samuel prayed so I could have mercy on the people. And God is saying, I'm telling you, if Moses were to try that right now, he would fail. I wouldn't hear him because I'm done. My mind is made up. I will destroy the land, destroy the temple, and allow the Babylonians to take the Jews into captivity. I am done. So even if Moses and Samuel were here begging me, Lord, have mercy, I would say, Moses, Samuel, I love you and I'll spare you. But don't waste your time. I'm done with the people. There's nothing you can do to stop me from bringing in the Babylonians to punish them, to kill their young men, to enslave their women and children, take them in captivity and destroy my temple. I am done. See what he just said? They won't appease me and stop me. I am done with my people. For now, not indefinitely, not completely, but for 70 years, 70 years, I will let my anger be poured out on them. 70 years, I'll let them to be oppressed. 70 years to be punished until I'm appeased. Then I will turn to them in mercy and bring them back. Now notice what he says in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 14, verses 14 and 20. Ezekiel 14, verses 14 and 20. Watch here. Read here. Though these three men, now remember Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they're prophesying at the same time during the Babylonian attack on Jerusalem. Notice both Ezekiel and Jeremiah, contemporary prophets say the same thing. Notice what God says to Ezekiel. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it in, in Jerusalem, they should deliver only their souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord Jehovah, Adonai Yehovah. Notice again, verse 20. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in Jerusalem, they were living right now. As I live, I swear by myself, they have Jehovah God, Adonai, Yehovah. They shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. If their family was wicked, I'd have them killed dead. I would save them, but no one else. Even if they were in Jerusalem, I would say, Noah, look which three men. Noah. Daniel and Job, as beloved as you are to me, as righteous as you are to me, I will save you, but no one else, not even your wives or your children, if they're wicked. Everyone's going. You won't be able to appease me because I'm done. I've reached that breaking point. They have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And now they've committed the sin that cannot be forgiven. It's done. You get it now? Is it making sense? What's happening? So what does it mean? And Jesus says the same thing, by the way. He says the same thing to the Jews of his generation. He says the same thing to the Jews of this generation. Okay. What does it mean? Well, let me give you another example. Are you ready for another example? I think I'm going to have to do like seven, eight sessions on this. It's like I think I'm going to finish and I don't because there's too much meat to cover, right? Let me give you another example. Why did God say to Abraham, it's going to take 400 years, 400 years before your descendants inherit Canaan? Abraham, you're living in Canaan right now, but you're not going to inherit it. Inherit it. Your descendants 400 years later will possess the land, but it's going to take 400 years, four generations. Why four years? Why four generations? Let's go to Genesis 15, verses 15 to 16. Genesis 15, verses 15 to 16. Exactly, Christos Anesti. Same thing. Right here. You guys know the answer, but let's, let's, let's see what Scripture says. Genesis 15, verses 15 to 16. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, if you read earlier, it's 100 years for each generation. 400 years from now. They shall come hither again. They'll enter this land. 
Why you're going to wait 400 years, God? For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Right there. There is a limit of how much sin I'll tolerate. Each generation, they keep filling it, filling it, filling it, and they reach the limit, and then it's over. That's when they're going to come in. Did you catch it? That's when they're going to come in. Abraham, I'm going to show them grace, mercy, love, and patience for 400 years. And that's going to be a testimony that they deserve the destruction that will come upon them because each generation, those infants, those cute babies, grow up to become moral monsters like their parents because what were their sins? Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20 shows you what their sins were. You can read at your own leisure. Read Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus 20. God says, this is what they do in the land. And this is why I'm going to vomit them out of the land. Don't do what they do. Killing their children as a sacrifice to Moloch. Infanticide. Sleeping with animals. Bestiality. Homosexuality. Incest. A mother sleeping with her son. A father sleeping with his daughter. Right? Idolatry. God put up with it for 400 years. God put up with it for 400 years. So it's a case of damn if you do, damn if you don't, right? God, why don't you strike them dead? Yeah, but if I wipe them out, you're going to say, what a cruel God, I killed even infants. But if I let the infants grow up and they become moral monsters, why would you allow them to do that, God? Damn if you do, damn if you don't. I don't win either way. If I wipe them out, you're evil for killing children. If I don't wipe them out and let the infants turn out to be moral monsters, then you're going to say, what kind of God is this that would allow Hitler to succeed and prosper? So there's no winning with you, no matter what I do. That's what God is saying. Exactly, King of Kings. That's another topic, but you understand what I'm saying, right? So in putting up with their atrocities, atrocities, their evils, their perversion, perversions, their orgies, their sexual moralities, their infanticide, idolatry, wasn't God showing them love and compassion too? Wasn't he, by allowing them to prosper and thrive and eat off the land and benefit from the sun shining on them and the rain providing for their crops and giving them health to work, and even giving them the health to allow them to do their abominations, wasn't that clear proof from God that he was loving them too and showing them love? Wasn't it proof? Right? So... God has shown and continues to show love for every creature. But when creatures continue to defy him, defile themselves, pervert themselves, and oppress those who do love him, there's a limit. And he goes, now you've reached the limit. Now let me tell you something. If the Lord Jesus doesn't return in our lifetime and he tarries, I guarantee you, because the God of the Bible is real, he is alive. He's almighty. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Bible is his word. America is doomed to be destroyed for all the unborn babies. It has murdered and justified the murder thereof. And for now, justifying transgenderism, lesbianism, homosexuality, bisexuality, adultery, fornication, and pedophilia. America too has a limit. And if the Lord tarries, we will reach that limit. And then will be a point of no return. And we will get what we deserve. America's not exempt. If God would do that to Israel, his covenant people, how much more to America when America is not God's covenant people? It's going to happen. Look what a tiny invisible virus did to the world. It destroyed the economy of the world and brought Americans to their knees and exposed them acting like wild, untamed beasts. Ravages, right? Beasts going to the supermarket, 
acting like animals, worse than animals, attacking each other, getting violent. And that's just the coronavirus. We haven't seen anything yet. Just saying nothing yet. You with me there? Is it helping you appreciate how deep the scriptures are, how miraculously, wonderfully consistent the message is, and how amazing the depth of the love, the mercy, compassion, and justice of God happens to truly be? Right? Clear? Exactly, Christos and Esti. America boasts on being a Judeo-Christian nation, so its judgment is much worse than the Muslim nations that have never embraced the gospel. Exactly, Christos and Esti. The judgment of the nation that claims the God of the Bible as their God will be much worse than a nation that doesn't know God. Amen, Thomas. You know. Is this sinking in? So now let me go back to what the point was with e Esau. Why did God say, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated? Now, the language of love and hate doesn't always refer to emotion. Let me repeat this. I want you to understand this, guys. Understand what I'm about to say because I don't want to confuse you. Are you ready? Yep, book of Judges. Are we ready now to go a little deep? Because I just showed you God loved Esau, right? Deuteronomy chapter 2 proved that. God loved Esau, right? Showed Esau love, compassion, mercy, right? And even loved his descendants, right? And even fought for his descendants to inherit the land, right? Clear, right? So no one can say God did not love Esau. I just proved it from Deuteronomy 2. He loved Esau and Esau's sons and blessed them and fought for them the same way he fought for Israel. Clear. Okay, so then why did he say, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated? Well, at times, and this is where it gets a little tricky, the Bible will speak of love and hate, not in the sense that God actually hates someone and despises them. At times, the language is used to show God favoring one over another, even though he loves both. Sometimes the language is used not in reference to someone you despise, but it's used in reference to a relationship in which, in which you favor one more than the other, even though you have love for both. Love for both, right? Can I give you an example of that? How you doing, truth, self, set you free? Can I give you an example of that? Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. Exactly, King Solo. You're sounding like William Lane Craig. Keep listening to Craig and keep listening to Heiser. You Heiserite. No, I'm just kidding. You Craigian. All right, Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. It's a comparative. It's comparative. Okay, here. For example, here's proof, guys. Listen to this passage. If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, one beloved, another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn, before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall indeed acknowledge, he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn, as the firstborn, because he truly is the firstborn, by giving him a double portion of all that he had, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Now, let me explain what God just said. If a man has two wives, he loves one and hates the other, and the one he hates gives birth to his firstborn, it doesn't matter that the firstborn was born to the woman he hates, the wife he hates. That's the firstborn. Recognize him as such. You understand what the law is saying? Right? I'm married to Kim Kardashian and Jennifer Lopez. And I love Kim Kardashian and I hate Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer Lopez gives birth to my firstborn. Even though I love Kim Kardashian more than Jennifer Lopez, I still recognize Jennifer's son as the firstborn because he is my first son and then give him the status of firstborn. Even though I love Je Kim Kardashian and hate Jennifer Lopez. 
Now it sunk in, didn't it? <laughs> it sunk in, right? See, I can't use the example of sisters here. So I have to use example. And by the way, that tells you, I think these women are beautiful, but unfortunately they use their looks to prostitute themselves and whore themselves in sin against God. May God save them and redeem them for his glory. Okay. Now, folks, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Do you think if that man literally hated one of his wives, he'd still be married to her? Don't you think he would have divorced her and got rid of her? Because it was his right, according to the law of Moses, to divorce a woman that he despised. But he didn't divorce her. He kept her. Why? Because hate here doesn't mean he hates her. He has no feelings for her. It means he loves one wife more than the other. He loves them both, but he, he loves this one more. That's what it means. It's not you actually hate someone. It's comparative. In comparison to this one, it's as if I hate this one, but I don't hate her. Because if I hated her, I get rid of her. I wouldn't have kids with her. You get it now? It's comparative. Making sense? Who's not getting it? I want to make sure everyone's getting it before I go there. So when it says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, it doesn't mean God did not love Esau. God did not love Esau. Right? It doesn't mean that. What it means is, God favored Jacob over Esau and chose Jacob to be the heir of the covenant over Esau, though he loved both and blessed both and bestowed grace and mercy on both and their descendants. Is it making sense now? Is it making sense now? Let's look at Luke 4, 20, 14, 26. Luke 14, 26. Luke 14, 26. Watch here. Luke 14, 26. If any man comes to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Does Jesus literally mean hate and despise your children, your spouses, and your parents? Is that what he literally means? Let me prove to you that's not what he means. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 39. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 39. What he means is, you can't love them just as much or more than me. You have to love me more and love them less. You love them, but not as much as me. You put me ahead of them. Here it is, the parallel. Matthew 10, 37, 39. He that loveth father or mother more than me, you see, is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. It's comparative again. He's not saying literally hate them. Do not love anyone as much as you love me, let alone more than me. Love me more than anything, anyone, even yourself. Making sense now? You see how the Bible marvelously comes to light? Wow, now it makes sense. Is it clear? Now it makes sense. In other words, my love for this one makes it light and makes it appear as if I hate this one, but it's not. I love this person so much that in comparison, it's like I hate this one. Looks like I hate this person, but it's not. That's not what it means. So when God says, I hate Esau, it doesn't mean I despise him and I hate his very being. You know, I hate him from the very, no, no. It means when it came to choosing the line that would be the heirs of the covenant, my covenant people, 
I chose Jacob, the younger brother, over Esau, right? And I have punished the Edomites for wanting to destroy you out of hatred for you. But don't get me wrong. I love Esau. I love his sons. And I fought for his sons. And I gave his sons land like I did you. But because they're stiff-necked and evil and oppose me, now the love I have is turning to hate, and I punish them accordingly. Lisa, Louisa, isn't God beautiful that in time and patience, if you seek with an open heart and you seek the Holy Spirit and ask him to show you, he will show you in his time like he just did. He clarified it. Exactly, Thomas. Now, let's, let's open up and talk about some other issues related to this topic to show you how real the Bible is, how genuine the Bible is in describing the heroes of the faith, warts and all. The Bible is a brutally honest record, an accurate record, an accurate historical record, as well as the inspired word of God, in that it tells you history as it is. It doesn't lie. It doesn't make things up. And it describes the characters of the stories in the most realistic fashion. Right? And it is a blessing, Luisa, that God is using me to speak to you. That means if God is answering you and he's using me to answer you, that means God also is blessing me and has I have his approval. Praise the Lord. Because God will not answer you by bringing you to a false teacher. So if the true God is answering you and he's using me, that means he's blessing you. And showing me I have his approval because he's using me to bless you. So we're all getting blessed by your answered prayer. Glory to the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, right? Now, I do want to share this because it shows you how dysfunctional even the heroes of our faith truly were. How dysfunctional the heroes of our faith truly were. Right. Notice I just said loving one, hating another doesn't mean you don't have any affection for the other. It means that you love this person more than this person, though you love that person as well. You love both, but you prefer and favor this one. You see that affecting families. Right. Now, God is a perfect being. His love is perfect. His justice is perfect. Even his hate is perfect, right? So when it says that he loved Jacob and hated Esau, he's not saying, let me repeat again. He's not saying he doesn't want Esau to be saved. He's not saying he doesn't want the children of Esau to be saved. He's saying covenantally, my covenant will be with Jacob and his sons. And through that covenant relationship, I will then bring about the salvation of everyone else. Through my covenant people on earth, through Israel, I will move the nations, the Edomites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Babylonians to want to worship the God of Israel. So through my covenant people, I will bless the nations and save them through them. That was the purpose of Israel. Let me explain the purpose of God singing out one family. So it sinks in. The purpose of God in choosing a family on earth to be his covenant people wasn't because he hated the other nations and wanted to have nothing to do with the other nations and didn't care if those other nations went to hell. No. His purpose was to use this people to be a light unto them. This is why, and I hope this makes sense. I hope this makes sense. Why do you think God told Israel to eat differently from the nations? to dress differently from the nations, to speak differently from the nations, to worship differently from the nations, because he wanted them to stick out like a sore thumb so that the other nations will look to him saying, why are you so different? Why don't you dress like us? Why don't you speak like us? Why don't you do things the way we do? Why are you so different? Because our God is different from your God's. Why don't you have sexual orgies? Why don't you commit bestiality? Why don't you commit infanticide? Why don't you commit incest? Because our God is different than, from your filthy gods.
And then through that, move these people say, you know what? The hell with Baal. The, well, the hell with Asherah. The hell with Astarte. The hell with Eel of the Canaanites. The hell with Zeus. We want to worship your God. We want the God of Israel. You understand the purpose now? Is it sinking in before I move on to the next point? Okay, is it making sense though before I move on? Okay, so what did Israel do? Shamed God, disappointed God, and embarrassed God to the nations. You know why? Instead of the nations running to Israel's God, Israel ran to their gods and goddesses and telling them, we'd rather have your gods than our God, showing them their God wasn't worthy of their worship. After all, if I run to worship Allah, why should they run to worship the God of the Bible? Because the person will say, hey, you used to be a Christian, right? You left Christianity for Islam. That means your religion must have been bankrupt. And in comparison to Islam, it must be no good. So why should I consider Christianity? If you left it for Islam, you see what's happening? See what the Jews are doing in the minds of the Gentiles? Every time they run after their gods and goddesses and say, hey, we want to join your worship too. We want to worship the gods and goddesses of your pantheon. We want to engage in sexual orgies. We want, and then they're looking saying then, hey, your God must not be that great. Your God must be not must not be that special if you're running to worship our gods. After all, if your God was all that, why would you run to our gods and goddesses? You see what they're doing? Now, let me show you Ezekiel 36, 20 to 23, what God says to the Israelites, to the Jews who are in captivity. Look what he's saying. Ezekiel <clears throat> 36. 20 to 23. Ezekiel 36, 20 to 23. Watch here. And when they entered unto the heathen, God is saying, when I scattered you to the Gentiles, to the nations, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. They insulted me. They shamed me in front of these heathens. When they said to them, these are the people of the Jehovah and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whether they went. Therefore say, uh, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith Adonai Yehovah, the Lord Jehovah. I do not do this for your sakes. I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel. But for my own holy name's sake, which you have profaned among heathen, whither you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord Jehovah, saith Adonai Jehovah, the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Very powerful, if you understand what he just said. Very powerful. You know what he said? Let me give you a little background. You know, when a nation defeated another nation, they assume it's because their God defeated the God of that people. See, the nations believed each group had their own God or goddess. So when you defeated a people, it meant that your God defeated their God. Their God wasn't as strong as your God. So you know what God is saying? Do you know, Israel, when I allowed the nations to beat you, enslave you, and imprison you, and destroy my temple... They took that to mean their gods are better than me and stronger than me, and I couldn't defeat them. You see what you did? You put me in a situation. You put me in a situation where I had to punish you through their hands, but in allowing them to do that, they took that as a sign their gods are better than me, and I was powerless to defend you against their gods. You embarrassed me. Before I move on, did it sink in? You understand what he said he's doing? Now I have to be zealous for my glory. Now I have to deliver you and save you and punish them and destroy their idols so that they will know they didn't defeat you because their gods defeated me. They defeated you because I gave them power to defeat you. 
and I alone am God, and they will realize I am God, and because of that, they will turn to me finally and be saved. You see what you did to me? You embarrassed me in front of the nations. Is it sinking in? Before I move on to the next point, is it sinking in? How amazing is the Bible if the Holy Spirit gives you eyes to see and ears to hear? Exactly, Pedro. So then what did God do, Pedro? He goes, enough. You keep failing being a light. Then I myself will become an Israelite and fulfill my own covenant. And I will be a light from Israel by becoming an Israelite, something you failed. That's Jesus of Nazareth. Why do you think he's called Israel? What Israel is supposed to be, Jesus actually is. So now I'm going to be one of you. I'm going to become an Israelite, a Jew. I'm going to fulfill my own covenant stipulations that you failed. And I'm going to be the very light from my own people when I become one of my own people by becoming flesh from them so that the light of Israel will shine to the Gentiles to bring them to the God of Israel because I, God, will become an Israelite to do what you failed to do. See what he's saying? I want them to worship the God of Israel. But if I wait for you to move them to jealousy to worship me, they'll never come to me. So now I'm going to become an Israelite. I will be part of my own covenant community, shining the light from my community as a sign to the nations. Worship the God of Israel because he's the only God worthy of worship. So I'm going to be an Israelite and Jew and be that light that you failed to be to bring people to the God of Israel to me. That's why after Jesus, millions and millions of Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, Indians have given up their gods and goddesses for the God of Israel because the true Israel has come and has done what the nation failed to do, being a light to bring people to the God of Israel. That's why right now in this chat, as we speak, there are Greeks, Assyrians, Egyptians, Indians, you name it. Your ancestors worship the gods and the goddesses. Until Jesus became an Israel, he says, enough. Your gods and goddesses are demons who are oppressing you, enslaving you, are evil and want to harm you and don't love you and mislead you. I am the only God worthy of your worship who loves you to the point of becoming a man to die for you, to save you. Come to the God of Israel. And he's done it successfully and perfectly. Because of the Jew Jesus, more people have fallen in love with the God of Israel than at any point in history. He truly has become the light shining from Israel to bring the nations to the God of Israel. You catch it now? So you understand how it works now? How could God hate sinners and their sin if he loves sinners but hates their sin? Did you get the picture now? Hosea 9.15 was the key. God loves people and shows them love to bring them to himself, but they reach a breaking point, a point of no return. Once they reach that point, God says, enough. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You grieve the Spirit. You reach the point of no return. My Spirit will no longer work to convict you. It's over. So now his love turns to hatred, wrath, judgment, destruction. Is it making sense now? No contradiction, right? So yes, God loves the, uh, all creation. Yes, God has shown love and kindness to all creation. But it's not indefinite. It doesn't go on forever. There's a limit. Let's go to Romans 1, 24 to 28. And I want to end it with some, some practical advice. And Lord willing, pray for my debate tomorrow. I need the supernatural anointing and filling to destroy the lies of Joseph Smith, this wicked dog of Satan, and silence Kwaku and bring him to the feet of Jesus and crush his lies for the glory of Jesus.
And do it graciously, lovingly, and boldly. Romans 1, 24 to 28. Romans 1, 24 to 28. Watch here. Pay attention to this, Pedro, before I give you the link. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now pay attention. What's saying? For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, Men with women, they gave that up for men. Men with men, women with women, which is unnatural against the design and the order of creation, right? Burn in their lusts one toward another. Men with women work, working that which is unseemly and receiving in their bodies sexually transmitted diseases as part of their punishment and judgment. That's what it's saying. Receiving in themselves the recompense, the reward of their error, which was me. Now notice 28. Notice 28. And even... As they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. See, that's the breaking point. These people knew God exists, turned away from God, worshiped their own desires, their own lusts, their own passions, worshiped the creature instead of the creator, perverted themselves, and they did so persistently to the point says, okay, I'm done. Let me hand you over. That's what you want? See, God will give you what you want. You want prevalent homosexuality? You want to justify homosexuality, lesbianism, idolatry, pedophilia, infanticide? You want it? Here you go. I'm done. I remove my hand. Here you go. Fill it up till it comes out of your nostrils and consumes you. So isn't it ironic that in doing that, in a way it's ironic. Let me tell you why it's ironic. It's God giving them what they want. Okay, you want it? Here you go. Go ahead. You get it? It's not God forcing them to co commit perverted acts. That's what you want? All right. So it's weird that even then it's an act of mercy and that he's just giving them what they want. All right. Don't complain then. Don't complain when I hand you over to the desires of your heart. Don't complain that because of these acts, now you got HIV, AIDS. Or you got herpes, or you got whatever it is. Don't complain that now you can't go to the bathroom, you men, because you've done acts in an unnatural manner that's now destroyed your rectum and you can't even use the bathroom, control yourself. Don't complain because you don't want it to do it my way. I just gave you over to what you want. You did it. And now you're suffering the due penalty in your bodies because of what you did. You get it? By the grace of Jesus, I pray I lose more weight, keep it off, and get healthier and more holy, holier for the glory of Jesus. Is that clear now? So now you learn. God hates the sinner and the sin. When the sinner has reached the point, he's now blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So now let me repeat what I'm saying here. There is a way in which you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You know how? When you keep resisting him, and resisting him, and resisting him, and defying him, and opposing him, and then there's a limit to how much Holy Spirit will tolerate. And he says, I'm done. You now grieve me to the point, I'm done. I hand you over. It's similar to marriage. Let me explain to you what I mean. It's similar to marriage. And I'm going to end it with two points, God willing. I got to mention these two points, and I trust the Spirit to guide me into all truth and save me from error for the glory of Jesus. Illuminate us to understand your word, Holy Spirit, and give us the power to live it for the glory of Jesus. Now, it's like marriage. You're in an abusive relationship and you constantly keep loving your spouse and loving your spouse and loving your spouse and your spouse disrespects you, dishonors you, abuses you, maybe even physically hits you and violates you. And only comes to you in their time of need, whether it's sexual gratification or whatever. And they're constantly cheating on you with other partners. And they laugh at you and mock at you. Finally, you have no love in your heart to give. You have no strength anymore to exert. And it's over. 
And you're like, I'm done. I can't do it. Can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. I can't do it. I'm done. I can't make you love me. I can't make you see how great my love is for you. And I don't have the strength to continue loving you anymore. You have killed me. You have murdered me. You have killed this marriage. It's over. I can't do it. I don't have it anymore. And it happens. It happens, right? Now, that's what happened to Jesus in the Bible. Do you know what the story of the New Testament is? Guys, I'm going to ask you to read when you can Ezekiel chapter 16 and Ezekiel chapter 23. They're quite graphic. Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 23. Write these down and then read Hosea chapters 1 to 3 and chapter 11. Hosea chapters 1 to 3 and chapter 11. Okay, can I give you a rundown? No, it's not buffering. We're okay. Okay, can I give you a rundown? Can you write these passages down again? Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 23. Hosea chapters 1, 2, and 3, and 11. Okay, let me give you a rundown of these passages. God and Hosea tells Hosea, marry that woman Gomer. She's a prostitute. Why? Because that's Israel. I married a whore. Do you know that? Listen, guys, I need you to listen now. I married a whore. I want you to marry a whore so you know what it's like marrying a whore who doesn't love you and wants to cheat on you constantly. You with me there? Sophia, don't worry about my debate. Focus here. It's more important. And you get it? Hosea, I want you to know what it's like to be married to a whore who doesn't love you. And then Hosea 3, it says that Gomer went back to prostitution, and she had been taken to prostitution. And God says, go, buy, go back and buy her and take her back to your house again and love her again. You understand what he, he's saying here? He married her. She went back to prostitution, and he had to buy her out of prostitution and then take her back as his wife at the orders of God. You know why? He goes, that's me in Israel. I took her out of prostitution. She went back to being a prostitute. And now I'm going to go and take her back again because I can't stop loving her. Are you ready now to be heartbroken? This is going to give you a picture of God that's going to break your heart. You're going to see how loving, compassionate, merciful, and humble God is. Ezekiel 23, Ezekiel 16 and 23 is even more heartbreaking. It says, I found Israel as an abandoned infant girl. Abandoned in the desert to die. This is Ezekiel 16. Guys, you got to listen now. It's going to really break your heart, honestly. And then I told her, live. She was about to die. This little infant girl abandoned, and I gave her life. Then I waited for her to become a mature woman, and then I married her. But she turned away from me. She became an adulterous whore and left me. Then Ezekiel 23, he describes how graphic it is. He says, you know, my relationship to Israel is this. A woman keeps leave, leaving her husband because the men that she's drawn to are physically attractive. And guys, I'm not lying. He says it. It's very graphic. Ezekiel 23 is very graphic. So graphic, you can't read it in front of little children. He says, you know what Israel did to me? Israel's like a woman who sees a muscular man with huge genitalia and keeps running after him and he ravishes her like a whore and dumps her and then I pick her up and take her back home. That's what Israel, Israel keeps doing to me. I'm not lying to you. That's what he says. I promise you that's what he says. Ezekiel 23, verses 20 to 23. That's what he says. You went after your lovers, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, because the size... Of their genitalia was huge. He says it. Because they had huge members. And you lusted after it. You know what God is saying? You know how God is describing himself? He's saying in comparison to the lovers. I was like the man. Who wasn't physically endowed. And wasn't physically attractive. Which is why my wife was never satisfied with me. That's how God is speaking of himself. Do you know that? Can you imagine your God talking like this? 
My wife is not satisfied by me. She doesn't think I'm physically attractive and physically endowed, which is why she keeps running after men physically attractive and endowed larger than me. And you know what they do to her? They, they devour her like a whore and dump her in the street. And I say to her, isn't it enough already? Isn't it enough already? Come back home to me because my home is always open to you. No matter how many men have devoured you, ravished you, and how many times you keep leaving me, I love you so much, I'll still take you back. Come back to me. Ezekiel 23, Eagle. Ezekiel chapter 23. You understand what Israel has been doing to God? Exactly, Pedro Jr. Exactly, Pedro. Isaiah 52. Exactly. Isaiah 53. So you know what the story of the New Testament is? Do you know what the story of the New Testament is? You, know, you guys, you still won't, don't know what the story of the New Testament is, right? The story of the New Testament is called the Great Divorce. Can I explain it to you what I mean? You know what it is? The God of Israel. Get him out of here, this guy. The God of Israel saying, enough is enough. You have killed my love. You have killed my spirit. Not literally. No matter how much I love you, no matter how much I chase you, no matter how much I beg you to stay faithful because these men can't love you the way I love you. No matter how much I beg you to stay faithful because these men can't love you the way I love you. No one can love you the way I've loved you. They just want to ravish you. You just don't love me. You just don't find me attractive. You just don't care for me. So now, with a broken heart, Israel, I give you what you want, a certificate of divorce. You're free. I'm done. I'm finished. That's why in Luke 19, 41 to 44, Jesus overlooked the city and started weeping because he's saying to his wife, farewell. It's over. You will never see me again. I'm done. Yep, Luke 19, 41, 44. Post it. Luke 19, 41 of 44. Right here. Let me read it to you. Post it, Protestant, before the rapture. So you can go out showing how amazing our God is. Did he leave? Did he get raptured? Okay. Luke 19, 41, 44. Guys, don't believe me here. Listen. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Now, guys, take a moment. Take a moment and visualize this. Visualize this. Here's your God in the flesh, Jesus. He's seeing city, Jerusalem, that represents his Old Testament bride. And he starts weeping. These are the human tears of the human face of the God of Israel. The God of Israel shedding human tears with a human face. And so the God of Israel looks at his bride and he starts weeping. He starts crying. Saying, if you had only known, if you just realized, at least in this day, the things which brings you peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you that your enemy shall cast a trench about you, encompass you around, hem you in, surround you where you can't get out, like birds in a cage, and keep you on every side. Now watch 44. Watch 44. And shall lay you even to the ground, you and your children within you, because and not leave one stone upon another, destroy all your buildings, because you did not recognize, you did not know the time of your visitation. I am your husband, and I came to redeem you back to myself, and you want to have nothing new with me. And he starts weeping, he says, Jerusalem. You've left me no choice. <clears throat> You've left me no choice. What more could I have done to love you? How many more times do I take you back after going to lovers who defiled you and ravished you because you were more attracted to them? Their gods look better than me, so you thought. 
I can't do it anymore. So I'm going to have to give you what you want. If you don't love me, you don't find me attractive, you despise my very appearance, here you go. Here you go. And you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if I never hear those words from your mouth, this is the last time you'll see me. Farewell, farewell my beloved. Farewell. This is the last time you will see me. Matthew 23, 37 to 39. Matthew 23, 37, 39. Matthew 23, 37 to 39. It makes you feel sad for God, doesn't it? Matthew 23, 37 to 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets, thou that killest the prophets. Read here. And stone, us, stone them which are sent unto you. How often, how much I desired, I, Jesus, desired to have gathered your children together as a mother hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you were not willing. You would have nothing to do with me. Now notice what he says here. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Your house is abandoned. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth. You will not see me again till you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. You see what he just said? I'm done. Can't do this anymore. I'm gone. The story of the New Testament is the story of the great divorce. Handing over his bride to the desires of her heart and leaving her be until the day will come where the nations gather against his bride and he comes down to save it. And then Zechariah 12 says, then they will realize you, you have always been our husband. That's Zechariah 12. Read it at your own leisure. I can't quote it now. You've always loved us and adored us, and you never gave up on us. You were just waiting. And so the story of the Bible is a husband returns to find his wife and take her back again. <laughs> That's the story. Waiting. And waiting, and waiting, and waiting. And then Zechariah 12 will be fulfilled. So that's what happened. That's the story of the New Testament. A husband's heartbreak because his spouse did not find him attractive and wasn't desirable. Now, guys, you know why this story takes, and again, please don't get me wrong. I'm not vilifying anyone. Do you know why this story, this story, and I'm no Jesus, I failed miserably. I was a rotten scoundrel. I failed. I couldn't, I wasn't Jesus in my marriage. I failed. I couldn't handle it. I was thinking of my own emotions and my own pain. But you know why this story has such a deep, reach, rich meaning in my life? You know why? It has such a deep, rich meaning in my life? Because I would hear, and again, please understand the context. May God save her because Jesus loves her. She's the mother of my children. And your mother's a scam too, this guy. I would hear for years, I would hear for years, I don't love you. I don't find you attractive. I'll never be attracted to you. And I'll love, never love you. I would hear that for years. Right? And then I would hear for years, me being compared to other lovers, and then I would hear for years her even comparing me in physical intimacy with other lovers. And then the knife, the knife that was dug, she started the affair with that Puerto Rican man in the gym. And I was 340 pounds. I had become an obese person. And she would say, I'm sick and tired of people saying beauty and the beast, that I'm married to the beast. And this guy looks like the rock. He's muscular and he's handsome like the rock. Look at you. So I get an idea, and God forbid I cl claim to be, I was in Jesus. I was in Jesus to her because I was too interested in my own pain and my own p feelings and my own satisfaction. So we became roommates at the end. 
But I understand what it's like to have someone say, I'm not attracted to you. I don't love you. I'll never be attracted to you and be compared to other lovers. So you understand now Ezekiel 23 and the story of Jesus and, and Israel takes a more deeper significance in my life. St. Dennis, no, no. He's asking me, no, Dennis. It's I don't hate her. I just, I don't have love for her anymore. I don't. I love my children, but I don't. I have no love for her. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. She gives her life to the Lord, fears the Lord. We can be brothers and sisters in Christ and raise our children, but my feelings have died. And I pray that God, by his grace and mercy that the Lord will allow me not to return to her, but just to be a brother in Christ to her. And she finds happiness in Jesus. Honestly, I'm done. Ten years, ten years. But anyway, that's why I mentioned this to show you. Now, with that said, with that said, Jesus will then sympathize with all the broken marriages. Let me tie it in so we can end it. Why I mentioned my story. You know that no one can have an excuse when they stand before the Lord and say, God bless you, Frank, and preserve you. No one can say, well, you don't know what it's like to have a cheating spouse. And Jesus will smile at you. Have you read my story? Pick it up sometimes, the Bible. The entire story is how my wife kept cheating on me because I wasn't good enough and attractive enough to her. You don't know what it's like to have your spouse compare you to other lovers. I don't. Again, have you read my story? Have you read the Bible? And see how my bride treated me. Or you don't know what it's like for a parent to lose a child. And you know what he's going to tell you? Beloved, my mother, my beloved mother, whom I love from my heart, saw me, her son, her firstborn, nailed to a cross, beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death and expiring before her eyes and then dying before her. Don't tell me I don't know what it's like to lose a child. I had to allow my mother to experience the heartbreak of losing her firstborn son before her eyes. You don't know what it's like to be hated by your brothers. Really? Have you read John 7? My brothers hated me and wanted to get me murdered by showing myself publicly to the authorities. My family members, Mark 3, 20 to 21, Mark 3, 31, 35, thought I was out of my mind and they were embarrassed by me and shamed by me and humiliated by me and wanted to lock me up in the house because they were embarrassed to be associated with me and to be seen in public. Beloved, let me tell you this. Jesus has experienced the depth of your pain, of your sorrow, of your heartbreak, of your misery, of your depression. He knows your condition better than you can imagine because he experienced it when he became man. That's why his heart breaks for you and he sympathizes with you. This is the great love story, the story of our God who lives, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. He is Yehovah in the flesh, the eternal heart, Son of the Father, one with the Spirit, our love, our life, our God, our Savior, our all in all. Keep us in love with you, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood. Protect my daughters. Bring their mother to your feet and forgive her and forgive us and forgive me for failing. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I think the link, is this the link to the debate? This is it. Tomorrow, God willing, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, pray that I can destroy the lie of Joseph Smith, silence the blasphemies of Quaku, and take him captive for Jesus. And Lord willing, I'll try to do a live stream tomorrow around 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Pray for my health. Pray for my daughters. And guys, I know it's hard. Thank you, you supporters who've been supporting me monthly on Patreon. Keep praying for the support to come in. Some of it has dropped because people and their circumstances, but pray that it keeps coming in so I can keep doing this for the glory of Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.